Um, Child-friendly tools are important, um, using something that is age-appropriate and the correct size. So not too sharp, not too heavy, not too old, something that's going to really enable them to like work in the garden successfully. Um, gloves can be helpful, um, just making sure that they're like safe and capable as well. And um, the last material that you need is an open mind. There's a lot of unknowing that goes on in creating a garden, um, and especially when you're working with a child, they may make recommendations that might be outside of your norm, but I encourage you to embrace those, and even if you know they might not be perfect, or like the perfect solution, go with it, um, and embrace that unknowing. Um, and also, it's going to be dirty, and it's gonna be really extraordinary as well. Oh, thank you. Um, when it comes to journaling, I have some activities here laid out um, that kiddos can do in their nature journal. Um, one day or one week, you can focus on like one topic. So like for example, on a Monday, you might want to like set up some sort of tracking system so that you can track plants and pests. Um, you can track like when you planted, when your plants are emerging, when the insects are emerging, where they're coming from, where the insects tend to gravitate towards. Maybe you only have certain insects in your tomatoes that aren't in the raspberries. Um, and so like showing your child and opening their eyes and saying, hey, look at these really tiny critters that are existing on this earth with us. What are they doing? Where are they going? What is their life cycle? Like, do you see smaller versions of that same thing? Um, and that's a way to really track and understand how time is moving within your garden. Um, art. Um, I wrote colors here because um, I am a firm believer in natural colors. So I will go out into a garden or forest space and actually like find leaves on the ground or soil or different colors of clay are really beautiful. And you can actually create art using nature itself. And so like lots of smudging or like even taking a stick and like using it as a pencil, like it might leave like certain lines. And that's all part of the exploration aspect. Um, and then you can also, you know, draw out an entire, your entire garden bed saying like, okay, here's the raspberries and like take a raspberry and put that color on the paper and you're like, this is the exact color of the raspberries at this exact moment in time. Um, you can also use paints and pencils. Um, I encourage using pencils without an eraser because it's okay to make mistakes. And so, yes, erasers are good, but if you have a pencil without an eraser, um, it's okay, and your child will probably ask for an eraser, but just teach them they can cross it out um, or make their mistake into um, art or just like carry on with your notes. Um, that's a good life skill. And then also science, of course, um, with any sort of journal or a, like data device, I guess. Um, you can make charts, graphs, observations, and when you start um, making a science observation in a nature journal, I recommend starting with your name and date at the top of the page and then labeling your page with a topic. So why aren't my something something growing as expected? Or like, you can list a question or an answer to a question that you might have or just walk around and make observations. Yesterday the plant was this high and today it's three inches higher. Um, and that's a good way to get your students working with different tools, like magnifying glasses and rulers and things. Responsibilities. Um, in your nature journal, you can also um, encourage responsibilities. And you can like talk to your student or child about time management. Um, and also let them know that nature has, their own, has her own schedule. Um, you can make the perfect calendar, and then if it doesn't rain on the day you expected it to, or maybe you were going to harvest one day, and then it rains the day before, so it's too muddy, like, it's okay. Um, but just understanding the cyclical motion of the seasons, um, and talking to your child about time, and how long it might take to do certain things. Um, and then also, the bane of my childhood existence was the chore chart. But now I'm here encouraging a chore chart, um, because you can make it fun. Use stickers, which is super cool, or like just like make it super simple and use smiley faces. But it's important for your child, if they're going to be part of the garden, to also take part in the chores. So regular watering, watering, um, feeding of your plants via fertilizer or compost, mulching, weeding, and also pest control. Um, and even if your child isn't able to take these responsibilities um, into their own hands completely, you can always help them and say, hey, today we need to go to the store and get this, this, and this. 
and bring them with you so that they can see what it looks like to actually harvest and create the food that they will eat. What to grow, especially if you're working with a child in your garden, um, it's important to make sure that you both are really excited about what you're doing. So um, what does your space look like and what does it feel like? So do you have a large space? Do you have a space that can um, grow lots of vines? Um, do you have a space that's more sunny? Does it feel hot? Does it feel cold? Is it windy? So think about what type of garden space you have and what types of things will grow best in that area. Um, you don't want to commit to growing potatoes if you have really, really wet soil because potatoes grow really well in dry, sandy soil. So think about what things feel like. What does the soil feel like? The air feel like? Which direction does the wind usually come from? And also to pay attention to the sun because plants need sunshine. And so hopefully your garden is in a place that's nice and sunny, but if it's not, grow something that might feel better in a colder environment. Also, plant for your own consumption, um, unless you're planting for somebody else's consumption, but my recommendations for growing your own food is finding what you already eat. So what do you eat? What are your staple items? Can you grow that in your space? My next recommendation is setting a goal, maybe. What would you like to eat? Would you like to get used to eating more kale? Would you like to get eat used to eating radishes, for example? Just try something, try to grow something that you have always walked by in the store and said like, oh man, I want to try that. And now's your chance to grow. Also, what does your child want to eat? Um, which may stump you, um, even in the moment, but ask them, like, what do you like to eat? What do you want to eat from your garden? What do you want to see grow? And involve, that, involve them in that process so that they're also able to make that choice. Let your kiddos choose. And then my last two points down here, um, if you have cats, try growing catnip. If you have bunnies, try growing lettuce. Um, make this a whole family fair event um, and involve as many as possible, even pets. Um, planting can be fun. And when growing with kiddos, um, depending on how involved they are in your garden process, um, you can make this garden one to remember. Um, you can use different themes. Um, an example of a theme that I have um, up here is the party theme, where you can grow popcorn and peanuts and watermelon, for example. Um, just think of things that might spark your interest. So maybe an Italian theme, and you might grow different things like tomatoes and basil, and then use it as pizza toppings um, in the future. But that's a way to really like focus on some tastes or flavors that you want and make a theme for your garden or even just a part of your garden. Um, you can also increase um, kids' excitement by growing things that grow really fast. So some things take a lot of time to grow, but some things like radishes and clover will spring right up. And that's pretty exciting for a child to see that, oh my gosh, it's growing! Um, even if the things in the back of your garden may not be growing um, as quickly, but at least they can see progress. Um, you can also plant in shapes, probably not for your entire garden, but if your child has picked something that grows fast or that won't get all weedy and out of control, you can plant in a shape, um, maybe like the ABCs or, le or numbers, um, maybe the first letter of their name, and you can just make a big A, for example, um, with the seeds. And so when the seeds sprout up, you can see that um, shape in the ground, um, which has been pretty cool in the past. I've done it, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's happening! Um, and also weird plants, curly plants, plants that like curl around things, um, plants with really vibrant colors um, in your nature journal, like kids can take those colors of those plants that you've um, grown and they can make oranges and reds and maybe the full color of the rainbow um, if you grow some colorful plants. Um, and also crafts. You can use plants to actually make crafts and so think about, you know, if you want to grow giant sunflowers or like stalks of corn, you can make them into holiday or seasonal decorations. Um, be creative with what you grow. Um, you can also be creative in what you grow by incorporating foods from all over the world. Um, you could do some research, but I labeled four here. Um, over here on this side, I put a circle over Mexico because that's where corn originated from. You can make this kind of into like a history lesson. Um, over here, Egypt, um, chamomile tea. Um, maybe your child isn't used to drinking tea, but um, if you grow some chamomile and then you read a book about Egypt and then you introduce some tea, you know, that can be a really powerful experience for your child to undergo. Um, 
I mentioned it earlier with the themes, but you can also incorporate it in world food and show them Italy and plants and basil, or Belgium um, grows Brussels sprouts. And even if kiddos don't always love to eat Brussels sprouts, they look pretty crazy when they're growing. They grow on big, tall stalks, and they've got the Brussels sprouts on the outside. So um, that's a pretty fun vegetable to witness, even if it doesn't taste the best for young taste buds. Um, getting ready for your garden. Um, right now, it's really, really warm, and so you might not need to um, start your seeds inside, depending on the weather and what your timeline looks like, but um, seed starting and sowing in your garden. Watering is super important. If you do seed start inside, um, you'll need to transplant your seeds, um, and then everything will start growing. Um, I have a calendar link that I can share with everybody that helps people determine what area they live in and then what's best for um, when to plant the plants that they chose. And so I can share that calendar with you, but it'll help you go through the system um, and really get your garden ready to start producing food. Um, here's a little um, slide about seed starting. Down here, the materials that you'll need to start um, growing your seeds inside. Uh, one of the reasons why you would could grow your seeds inside is because if it's too cold to plant outside and if the soil's too cold, um, your seeds won't germinate. And so you can plant your seeds inside first, starting with your materials. You'll need seed starting mix, so that's like a soil mix. Um, trays with holes so that any water or excess water that's in the tray can drain off the bottom so that it's not just sitting in the tray with your seeds. Um, next, you need the seeds. Um, pick them out and also read the directions. Um, seeds get planted at different levels within the soil at different times and they need, they have different needs. Um, and so make sure you read the directions on the seeds that you choose. Um, and also bring your child into the store and help them pick out some seed packets. Um, it's pretty crazy when you look at, you know, an entire wall of seeds and, you know, certain colors or tastes pop out. Um, but watching somebody else choose is really fun too. Tags. Um, don't forget to label your trays that you plant your seeds in or you'll be lost. So make sure you get some tags as well. Um, and then planting. Fill a tray with the mix. Right, you've got your tray with the holes. Fill your tray with mix. Pour some seeds on top, following the directions. Sometimes uh, certain seeds are closer together or farther apart or lower or higher in the mix. And then um, after you put the seeds on top, you're going to put some more mix on top of the seeds, just a little bit so that they don't get dried out. And then you'll take water and you water the entire tray, um, usually until water starts coming out the bottom. And then you cover it and you set it aside in a nice warm place. Um, and eventually, your seeds will germinate. And when they start to grow and sprout out from the soil, um, you can begin getting them used to being in the outdoors. That's called hardening. Um, you can bring them outside for a little while, let them sit in the breeze, and then bring it inside if it gets too windy or too cold. But this is how you start seeds inside. And it's a pretty fun thing to do with a child because you can sit at a table and explain everything and have it all laid out. And if you're growing in containers, you don't have to have a tray with holes. You can have a pot with holes or a milk carton with holes. And so you can also let your child pick the color and the shape and the size, um, which can help include them in the process. Activities. Um, as an outdoor educator, I love doing activities. Um, depending on how much time you have or how big your garden is, um, you may find some of these um, activities useful. So hopefully you enjoy. Um, this is a picture of an old banana. Um, if you're like me, every once in a while, you'll have an old banana in your house. And if you don't freeze it to make banana bread, you can actually hang it in your garden. Um, right here, there's wire going around the banana. And the banana is super, super sweet. And as you know, if they've sat on your counter long enough, they actually start like oozing a little bit. And butterflies love that sweetness. And so you can hang your banana in your garden and watch what insects come and interact with it. Even if they aren't blood butterflies and you accidentally get ants or beetles, it can still be a cool um, observation activity. Um, over here, there's some cards where each child drew their own pot, and then they put holes above the pot that they drew, and they walked around their yard and picked up weeds, such as dandelions, um, or flowers that aren't in somebody else's garden, and you can make your own little pot um, using your art and also the plants that are just out and about. Um, and you can do this in your garden as well, if you have any flowering plants um, that you grew specifically for a craft. 
Um, here's an example of making the food that you grow fun. Um, there's some insects created using cucumber, celery, tomatoes, um, little pieces of pepper, some grapes, strawberries, um, some basil. And so those are ways that you can make eating all this fresh food really fun. Um, and you can involve your child in making these creations too, which can be really um, fun as well. You can talk about like, how many legs does an insect have? How many, like what are the different types of body parts for an insect? Or you can just let them go free range and see what they create. Um, and then over here, this fuzzy guy um, was actually made in a nylon stocking. And then you take an old nylon sock, um, you should be able to like see through it. So it should be like that, like dressy type of sock um, or tight. Um, and you fill it with some of that potting soil or nutrient dense mix and then you grow and then you add in um, grass seed. And so the grass seed, um, once you tie the tie in the nylon, you'll have a log of soil with grass seed in it. And the grass seed will actually start growing out of the nylon. And it can be fun to later unwrap um, when the root structure has really like helped form that shape and you can add your own crafts, um, like pipe cleaners and things, googly eyes. Um, or you can also get your child used to using scissors as well and actually give your new friend a haircut, um, which can be pretty fun. And um, using scissors is quite, um, it's quite a good skill to have for young kiddos. And so if they practice cutting at weird angles, um, that can help them with those fine motor skills. Working with what you have, potatoes, beans, and greens. Um, at least in my home, I have a bunch of potatoes, um, I have some dry beans, and I usually have some greens on hand. And so I actually brought some materials with me today. In order to grow some potatoes, you'll need to find a potato with um, sprouts. And so this spud is actually sprouting. You can see that my potato has like a weird, knobby sprout on it. All right, so you'll find a potato like this with some sprouts on it. Um, if you don't have one, you can just buy regular potatoes and let them sit and sit and sit and sit, and eventually they'll just start growing their own. Um, this potato lasted from the fall, and so I'm really surprised that it's not covered in sprouts. But you'll find a potato with sprouts. You will cut it into sections that are like one, two inches, a pretty good chunk. Um, and take a chunk that has a sprout on it. You'll poke toothpicks into that chunk. Uh, just a reminder, this potato is not cut, so I'm showing you a rough example. It's a rough model. So you'll put your toothpicks in the chunk of your potato with the sprout, and then you'll expose a raw edge of your potato to the water that's in your cup. And so you'll put the chunk of potato with the toothpicks on top of your cup, You'll fill the cup with water, um, and then that water will just kind of meet the potato. Um, and if you let it sit long enough and you add some fresh water every once in a while, your sprouts will actually turn into vines, which is a cool, you know, countertop science experiment using a potato, something you may already have in your house. Another fun activity that I do with beans, I grab some dry beans that are less than five years old, preferably like one or two years old. Um, and dry beans will usually germinate under the right conditions. And so you can create those conditions with a Ziploc bag and one piece, I have too much here, one piece of, what is this called, paper towel. Um, and you can make your paper towel wet and then actually fold just once. You'll fold the beans into your wet paper towel and then you'll put your wet paper towel and your beans into a Ziploc bag. And you can let the Ziploc bag just lay on the counter next to a window, or you can actually tape it to the window. And eventually your beans will start germinating and sprouting, and you'll be able to see the sprout, and then some leaves, and the root structure. Um, and because you're, in, you're using a clear Ziploc bag, and because you only folded the wet paper towel once, you'll actually be able to see those, be those beans growing inside of it. And then last but not least, greens. I do not have any lettuce to show you, but um, you can take a section of lettuce and once you cut the lettuce off the top and use it for salad or whatnot, um, you can actually take that stalk and with like a smooth, freshly cut edge, you can actually put it in a glass of water. Um, make sure that the water doesn't get too old or warm 
or a weird color, um, but if you keep that water clean, there will actually be new lettuce leaves that sprout out of the lettuce that you actually bought from the grocery store and made your salad with. So that's a good way to extend the life, the life, the time um, of your lettuce um, and actually grow some more food from what you already have. 400 million. Um, this number is pretty wacky for adults, but also kiddos. And this is the amount of insects that can be found on an acre of land. Now, this isn't specifically for a garden, and it's probably not a monoculture space, but in a given healthy acre of land, you can have 400 million insects. And so I write this in here because when working with kiddos, you should tell them there's a lot of insects that exist, there's a lot of insects that are actually in this space that we can't even see. And with the help of an insect ID book or an insect app, um, there's actually an app called iNaturalist that can help you identify different plants and insects and animals that you find um, in your local area. But um, using a tool like that can help you find some of these insects, whether they're above the ground, below the ground, or somewhere right in between. Um, that, that can be a really cool concept for your children to grasp. And this is a really large number, so you can also teach them hundreds, thousands, 400 million. And you can kind of build it on that and incorporate some math into your outdoor learning during the summertime when they might not be in school. Um, for the birds, uh, you can also encourage um, your gardening kids to reach outside of the garden space. And you can work with other animals like birds. And you can build structures such as houses, bird feeders, um, and also bird baths. And these are projects that you can either like do in your shop if you have a shop, but with really minimal tools. You can also buy a kit online and put something like that together. And this can be a really great bonding activity, but also you know, a way for your children to get used to using tools and actually making a structure for an animal that lives right in their backyard. Um, and then after your structure is constructed, you can actually observe, using your nature journal, um, those birds that come to visit your space. Um, binoculars, a bird ID book, and also like a backyard bird checklist can be a really fun activity. Um, I've seen people, little kiddos running around, and they're like, I found a female cardinal, I've been waiting! And like, I would have never heard that sentence ever, you know, proclaimed had we not had like a little checklist. And so um, these are just fun things that you can do. And you can even make a checklist in your journal. You don't have to like print anything out. You can just, you know, find what's in your local area. Um, aside from birds, there's also a lot of other things that you can invite into your space and into your mind. Um, butterfly kits are really popular and fun. You receive caterpillars in the mail, and then they actually eat. And um, out of this little jar, and then they'll go to the top of the jar, make their chrysalis, and eventually they'll turn into butterflies. Um, and those butterflies you see here are flying around in a little basket, um, and so your children can actually see them go from caterpillar to chrysalis to butterfly right in front of their eyes. And then if your butterflies are native to this area, which they should be, then you can like release them into your own backyard, and they can continue interacting with the garden um, and the other critters that you've invited into your space. Venus flytraps are super cool, carnivorous plants. Um, like, what is cooler than a plant that eats an insect? Um, but that, that can be a fun um, observation for children to make. Um, just like seeing what a Venus flytrap is, um, where they originated from, what types of insects they eat, um, etc. Sensitive plants are a type of plant that are sensitive. Um, in this picture, it shows that the stem of a sensitive plant comes out and they have little tiny leaves, kind of like a fan, like a V shape. And when you take your finger and lightly brush it across the top of the plant, the plant will actually close. And that's a really cool activity for a child to sit with a plant and watch the plant move based on their own touch. And so they can do some, yeah. Does the plant close if I blow on it? How hard do I touch it? What if I touch it with a paintbrush or a leaf? Something like that. Um, mushrooms are super cool. Um, you can inoculate logs in your backyard if you have a shaded spot with pine trees, or you can just buy a kit online if that interests you. Um, but this is an example of a kit. Your, um, your growing structure, like your soil or um, vermiculite, will actually be in this bag. 
and you'll buy the bag and then you'll buy the spores and you can inject the spores into the bag with like a syringe. Um, they also come pre-inoculated, meaning that your spores can already come in your bag if you don't want to do the injection. Um, but you can put the spores into the bag and then under the right conditions, the mushrooms will actually start growing out of the side of the bag. And so this can be a really cool activity for your counter, kitchen table, um, what have you, but you can actually grow your own gourmet mushrooms. This is an example of blue oyster mushroom, but uh, I mean, they're beautiful. Um, and they're really cool to like look at the underside and the overside and all of a sudden when you grow mushrooms on your counter, you'll start seeing mushrooms everywhere. Like, oh, there's some in the yard, there's some on the sidewalk, there's some on this tree. And so it opens like a whole new world of observation and exploration. Um, last on this slide is bat houses. Um, almost as important as bird houses or equally, I'd say, um, bat houses can be built, construct constructed, and put in your backyard um, so that bats have a place to actually live. Um, in your own space. So at night you can see them flying around and eating insects and interacting with your garden. Um, and nighttime, especially in the summer when it's warm and there's a lot of critters out and about and you can hear them, you can do some really cool outdoor exploration at night. Um, you can raise your deer ears and listen. You can talk about spring peepers. You can observe bats. Um, you can you know, hit rocks together and you know, see that tribal luminescent light. Um, and so I'm encouraging people to go out, explore safely in their own spaces um, during the nighttime, and having a bat house or bat box can um, help bring more mammals to your place. Um, this one's a little bit tricky. Um, I am not a fond believer in using tech um, as often as a lot of people do nowadays, but I did find some mobile apps that can be used um, to actually help um, encourage more interaction with the garden. And so I have some pictures here. If you have access, um, people on Facebook Live, to the presentation. Underneath the presentation, there's some notes at the bottom if you're looking at the PowerPoint, and you can see the names of these different apps that I pulled up. Um, but an app can help kiddos see a calendar. They can track their habits. They can also like track their chores in the garden. Um, you can check a weather app and kind of predict what's going to happen or see what the trends are. And you can also take progress pictures, which is really cool. So you can take a picture a day or a picture every other day of your garden space, uh, of your plants growing, and you'll be able to see the changes um, over time, especially when you're flipping through and you put them all in the same folder. And so um, mobile apps can help um, and encourage more interaction in the outdoors. Happy gardening, everybody. Um, I hope that people have some questions. If you do, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, overall, I hope that you have fun in your garden. You empower your children to make their own choices and help as much as possible. And even on the days where it's really hot or really sticky, encourage them to come outdoors because then the bountiful harvest in the fall will be even more enjoyable. So thank you for being here. Um, virtually or in person, um, and yeah, does anybody have any questions?